The best choice here is choice B, vernicus encephalopathy. Let's look at what makes choice B the best answer here. There are abnormal T2 flare signal in the classic location that make one think about vernic encephalopathy, particularly along the medial thalami, as well as around the third ventricle. Another classic location is involvement of the mammillary bodies. So when I see abnormal signal here, one of the first things I think about is vernic encephalopathy. The differential diagnosis is quite short. Another location is around the tactile plate or by the periacoductal grade. Now, often there's enhancement and restrict diffusion associated with this area. In this particular case, I put a parenthesis right here because here we don't really see that much enhancement. There's just a thin enhancement around the lateral edge of the thalamus. For vernicus encephalopathy that they can ask you on board exam, as you know, it's due to thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency. And classically, you see that with uh, chronic alcoholics, it's not so much due to alcohol abuse, but rather from malnutrition. So anything that interferes with absorption of vitamin B1 um, can cause vernicus encephalopathy, such as GI surgery, such as GI malignancy, or condition that can cause prolonged vomiting, etc. If this is not treated, it can lead to a more chronic state, leading into Korsakoff psychosis. Therefore, it's very important to recognize the abnormality, particular involvement of the mammary body and the periacoductal gray to make you think of vernicus and subalopathy because this is reversible. Let's look at some of the choice that does not work as well here. Choice A, herpes and cephalitis. Typically, the involvement is medial temporal lobe, limbic system. It's often bilateral, but often asymmetric. There is typically restrict diffusion and there is variable enhancement and sometimes you can see microhemorrhage on susceptibility weighted image. This is due to HSV1. This is another pathology that needs to be recognized because you need to treat the patient empirically if you don't recognize the finding and do not initiate the treatment right away. The long-term sequelae could be pretty bad. Artery approach on occlusion. This is an example of bilateral thalamic acute infarction due to artery or perch on occlusion. Notice that there's abnormal flare signal and restrict diffusion involving the medial thalami bilaterally without affecting other structure in the PCA territory. So what is artery or perch on anyway? Normally, as you can see in this very nice illustration from AJ in our article, the medial thalami is supplied by a small perforating artery that's originated from tip of the basal artery or from the proximal P1 segment. Artery per trunk is an anatomical variant where the single trunk artery from a common origin that is supplying all the same structure, including the medial thalami. So in order to cause bilateral thalamic infarction in a normal anatomy, you need to have a thrombosis that's big enough to cause obstruction of both arteries, so a typical basilar tip thrombosis, for example. However, if you see that, usually you will affect more than just medial thalami, including, including infarction involving other structure in the PCA territory and potentially in the superior cerebellar artery territory. If you have a artery pertron variant, a thrombosis can be quite small, causing obstruction at the origin of the common trunk causes selective infarction of the medial thalami without affecting other area in the PCA territory. So that is artery or perch on infarction involving the medial thalami bilaterally only without affecting other PCA structure. Choice D, osmotic demyelinating syndrome. This is a picture of central pontine myelinosis, the classic picture of diffuse involvement of the pons with preservation of the descending cortical spinal tract give you that very distinct two dot appearance. And to some that look like a piglet, so piglet sign or a trident sign. Now, osmotic demyelin syndrome can involve more than just pons. They can have extra pontine involvement, hence extra pontine myelinosis, usually affects structure in the thalami basal ganglia or internal capsule, deep gray area as well as middle cerebellar peduncle and splenium of the corpus callosum.
It is, however, uncommon to have extra pontine involvement without central pontine myelinosis. So usually when you see extra pontine involvement, you will have this classic picture of pontine involvement. That, of course, looks different than Wernicke's encephalitis. Lastly, CNS lymphoma. Now, CNS lymphoma is one of those gray mimickers that can look like basically anything that you want. So it's a good differential diagnosis to think about if things does not make sense. But for CNS lymphoma, they typically show some degree of enhancement, even in an immunocompromised patient. So this would be an example of a CNS lymphoma. Remember, they also should show restrict diffusion due to hypercellularity and small blue round cell tumor. While it is possible that this could be CNS lymphoma, it's not the best choice. Besides, in our particular case, you really don't see much enhancement at all, making CNS lymphoma far less likely. So the best choice is B, Wernicke's encephalopathy. That's all for this brain case number 12. Thanks for your attention and good luck on your board exam.